So now we're here in the buses, the most important part of the template. Here we go, the big reveal. <laughs> da, 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 da. No, we're not gonna show this actually. Okay, good night, folks. It's great to see you. Come back again next time. Series two, we're gonna show this to you, right, Fernando? Oh, yeah. All right, let's get out of here. Let's get a pizza. All right, okay. Let's All show right. it now. Let's show it now. We'll show come it. on, come on. Okay. Show it. The first bus is something that I implemented just in the Vox for routing purposes. We didn't have this in the analog. It's just something I call V, where we send our lead vocal wet. Has no processing. Maybe I'll put a DS or if needed at some point. But we start now with A. When we went hybrid, the summon mixer that we were using was the Neef 8816, if my memory doesn't fail me. So before actually emulating the compression, I had to emulate the tone that that summon mixer was adding. I went and listened to all the summon plugins available, and this is the one that I ended up with. Virtual Mix Bus from Slate on Brit N setting. We all know what that stands for. What does it stand for, Fernando? <laughs> British Neve. Thank you. I think. And I ended up using around six of their uh, drive. And obviously noise reduction on, so we don't want any unwanted noise. So that did the trick for what the summon was doing. And just so you understand, the way we had everything patched was from our interfaces, they would uh, go 16 channels into the summon mixer, which then would sum down to two channels into the 33609 hardware, which then would go into the pull text. So when I was actually doing this, I had to break our setup apart to pull the cable so I could listen to just the summon mixer so I could truly get the sound of the summon mixer and emulate it. So once I was happy with that, I Patch back in the 33609s and 33609 from UAD. Not much to do. One to one settings, the same way we had them on the hardware. And it sounds just exactly like it. So I was very easy. And when I first put together the template, I used the UAD EQP1A, another one to one emulation, which since we have changed it to this tube tech for the same reasons that I explained earlier. Basically, it sounds pretty much the same, and we save a ton of processing power in our computer. There it is, that's A, that's the big reveal. So moving to B, we actually have three chains for B, which I will get to in a moment, but starting with the original chain that I actually modeled. Same as with A, we had a summon mixer before the compressors, and this was the Chandler mini mixer. Same process, I was looking for a summon plugin that will give me that sort of like punch characteristic that the Chandler had. And I ended up with the Waves NLS on the mic mode, 5.5 drive, just under six. And again, it gave me that tonality that I was looking, and then I could move to actually matching the compressor. When I first started doing this, this plugin didn't exist. So there was a version where we had the Arouser from Empirical Labs, which is, was kind of like their plugin version, but not really. And then there was some obscure plugin, like some indie plugin that was doing the distressor that we had for a moment, wasn't that great. Then Slate came out with a distressor that was very exciting at the moment. So we had that for, for a little bit. But then UAD came out with their distressor and that was just a perfect match. The problem. Yes. This doesn't have the British mode. We used to have the distressor that actually have the British mode, but their plugin does not emulate the British mode. It was a toggle switch that had popped in that, that I asked David to put in, customize into, uh, into his unit because I wanted to kind of get that 1176 with all the buttons in kind of feel, which was my answer, which is what I always had in. So when the distressors came out, none of them had that in, and it really changes the character of the distressors for me. So I ended up basically using, of course, the original distressors don't have, you got a dry, wet mix on here. And so I'm kind of 
leaning towards the dry to help a little bit with that initial transient that I was getting when I had the little toggle switch in. So besides that little caveat, it was a great emulation. And I started with the, with the same settings we had. I believe I might have had to tweak just a little bit of like the input to get the same gain staging, but like we're talking about like millimeters here. It was pretty much perfect. After the stressor, Michael had his Avalon's E55s. They had a very specific sound and it took me a while to get here. There were very different iterations with just, I think I was using the Mani EQ at some point, the Millennia EQ from UAD and just different EQs to, to try to get to that sound. And then when UAD came out with their 737, I was like, well, that's a compressor, but it has an EQ section and it has the Avalon sound. So UAD 737, compression section is off. Preamp gain is just at Unity. So what we're really working with here is the EQ section. So the bass frequency, I'm just leaving alone because in the E55s, we were just using three bands, which I am using here. For the low band, we are boosting around just one dB at 75, a couple of dBs at 4.5K, and a couple of dBs shelf around 12K, which are pretty much the same frequencies we're doing on the E55s. The thing missing to me which was kind of maybe unintentional, maybe not. But if I remember correctly, when we would put stuff through B, the E55s at the bottom had that little LED light. And they were usually red. So what was happening was the signal would come in a little bit too hot and the output of the EQ would distort a little bit. But that became part of the sound, right? Which this plugin was not doing. So what came to the rescue again? Because it was just like a little bit. Black box again. I just added this black box at the end just to get a little bit of that extra character. And that really put this whole chain together. Let's think about this for a second, right? This is how detailed he got, not just from a technical standpoint, but from a musical standpoint, which means that Every step of this, he had that opportunity to listen to the real world compared to the digital world. So he could compare and know immediately this was good or this was not good. But the detail that he would go through each of these, you know, I didn't pay attention. I wasn't watching over him. I just said, you know, please, I want it to feel the way I, I do right now. And, 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 so the fact that he went to these lengths, especially, you know, the little, the little green light that would turn red, that to him was a sound. I never paid attention to that. I never had any idea. I go, oh, it turned red. He's like, it turned red, and I can hear that there's something different. For me, I'm like, I like the vibe. You know, I'm a vibe guy. You know, he's like, that's very nice, except I got to figure out how to emulate your vibe, you know? <laughs> and so... This is actually the first time I'm hearing of all of this, of you know, the lengths and how he went through this. So it's very, very interesting. You know, as far as you guys are going to be concerned, it's you if you can, you know, have access to these plugins, your starting point is where I left off, you know, 30 years of developing this kind of stuff to the point where it still sounds like this in the box. So let's move to the other two buses so we finish with the actual emulation and then we'll come back to the extra chains we created with B just in the box that we added later. So for guitars, for bus C, we had the Tone Lux OTV16 summon mixer. Which was modified by Paul for me because I loved the widener that was on the Neve summing, right? And I was like, Hey, Paul, can you give me that on your Tone Lux? And he was like, yeah, sure. And so mine is the only unit that actually has the same kind of widener. And of course, I'm putting guitars on it. So it's nice to already have the guitars just a little bit wider. There's a little bit of a chain. Mr. Slate comes up again. Yes. 
So on this one, you'll see that I'm actually playing a little bit with the input of the and the output to hit it a little bit harder, but then not actually make it louder. So a little bit of a gain stage in there. And I chose the Brit 4K E setting. And again, why I chose this one, which is probably modeled after an SSL, it was just by ear. It was just what sounded good to me compared to the actual unit. But you can see, actually, I use more drive on this instance. It's up to nine. But I had to follow it with Revival, adding quite a bit of thickness and also a good amount of shimmering. And that gave me the tone I was looking for, but it would probably make it too loud. So I just added a plain trimmer and took it down to where the input and the output level were the same. Michael just said that his unit was modified to have a widener. So I had to incorporate that too. I'm sorry. <laughs> Brainworks, again, very simple. Just stare with to 120, nothing else happening. I just had it to open that up a little bit more. And the summon mixer, the widening was a little bit. So you started with the guitars a little bit open, but it wasn't like one of like our other two wideners. So that's why it's just like a little 20%. And then we get into the actual compressor. So we had the Pendulum ES8, which was a very mu type compressor. So Manly very mu actually did the trick very well. Obviously, this is not a one to one. So I had to play with this quite a bit to make it react in terms of attack and release and amount of compression and how it would move when you actually put in guitars, similar to how the ES8 was doing. So once I got it to a point where I could put the guitars through the ES8 and through these, even though they're separate units, but they're behaving the same and they're making me feel the same, then I was happy with the chain. And as usual, sent it to Michael, check it out, and he was happy with it. The final processed bust is D, which is the compressor widener for the backing vocals. When we were back in the analog console, Michael had Edward the compressor, which was the compressor widener in the main room. So the hybrid room that the former assistants put- um, Also had an Edward. Also had an Edward, but they had already started playing with, with trying to make a version of D in the box. And what they came up with was this plugin called the S73 by Softube. So I started with that when I was putting this together and I, I, I could understand why they chose it. It kind of did the same thing, but not really. So when I actually had to match the thing, it didn't work. I started playing with just a lot of compressors to try to get the same feel. And the one that really worked for me was the Magic Death Eye from DDMF. So I originally started with the gray version, which is the, the mono version, but it was obviously stereo plugin. And then later on, they came up with the actual stereo version, which is the black one. And I ended up using that one. It just sounded fantastic. It reacted compression wise, pretty much like the Edward was reacting. And the, the tone was very, very similar. And then BX again with a lot, lot of widening, 200% of widening. And if we can see here, just a very, very, very small EQ curve, just half a dB at 500 and 0.3 dBs at 4.5K, which were probably just like very, very small frequencies that were being added by the Edward that I just wanted to make sure we had here. That's it. Then E is just our unprocessed bus. It comes from the LF mix from the SSL. We actually had called it LF mix for a little bit, but then we're like, it's not really an LF mix anymore. Let's just call it E to go in order. And that's what it ended up being. So those are the chains that I emulated. Later on, as Michael started mixing more and more in the box, we started coming up with a couple of different chains for the drums, which are not emulating anything. It's just stuff that we, we like how they sound. So the second chain, it starts the same as the other one with the same emulation and it finishes with the same EQ, but the compression changes. This Oxford Dynamics is very, very transparent. We're using it on records, maybe like Fusion or Jazz, where we're trying to get the controlness, but we don't really want to color the sound too much. What I liked about the Oxford Dynamics is that one, it is clear, and there's certain records where I just don't want to really hear the processing, yet I want a bit of a transient control. 
And it, it has that ability, it's almost like to a much lesser degree than a smack attack, but there's something about it that just gives me a little bit more presence without the other artifacts of processing and stuff. So I really, really like, I mean, everything that Sonics does is uh, really, really musical, incredibly useful for whatever application you're looking for. And so I don't use it often, but there are times where I just don't want my whole distressor thing going on. And, and I just want it to just to kind of just temper slightly without really noticing what's going on. Leave the drums alone. I could even take it out and have nothing, but, but I do like the bit of the glue factor that, that the Oxford Dynamics adds. And what we're doing on it is pretty soft. I mean, I've got the warmth in, I've got the compressor in, the attack is around 19 milliseconds, a bit of a hold, nice release. It's just a very natural sounding, uh, transparent dynamics section. So that was choice two, which I wouldn't have done back in the day when I had, when B was always, always allocated to my distressors. And so this was great. And then I was doing some records and I was like, gosh, you know, the, this distressor, it just seems just a little too aggressive and too pumping for the kind of record I want to be doing. And Fernando goes, I've been using this other chain when I'm mixing stuff. And I go, oh, let me, you know, can I, can I hear it? And so he opened it up and it was exactly what I was looking for for this particular song that had more of a, I don't know, I was looking for what was like more of a bit of urban bottom. A little more, more like a pop modern, old program drums, urban, low end type of feel. Tight and not, not so rocky, which the distressors tend to put you in that direction. So he was using this blend with David's great EQ. I use that often, or sometimes he'll just put it in because he thinks that's the right direction for a song. I'll be mixing along and I'm like, well, this feels good. And then I'll go, huh, I wonder if he put his chain in there. And then I'll go <laughs> to it and I'll go, he did put that chain in there. <laughs> and then I'll go, well, just to make sure. And then I'll just do a, you know, a, a, what a shift two, three or whatever, yeah, yeah. whatever that thing is. And I can just jump between the two, you know, and I'll be like, I'll close my eyes. I'm like, oh, this one sounds good. This is Fernando's chain. Okay, we're good. <laughs> we continue. I think that's great. I think it's great to have these kind of options. Do I want to do that on the guitars? Do I want to do that on A? No. Not for me. You guys, go for it. Have your options. This is, this is your starting point. This is a culmination of 30 years of, of doing this. Remember, I started with the most basic back in 1986 or something, 1987, because by the time I did the first tape op in 2003, I'd already been doing it for years, right? Here we are starting from actual multi-bus mixing, compression mixing to now, who knows, who cares? <laughs> Everything's flying, you know? And anything is, is available, which is what I think is wonderful about being in the box, as long as what you end up with sounds great. You know, again, this is a tool for your creativity, not a tool to guarantee anything. <laughs> so now it's time to talk about the vocal. Because originally, the lead vocal used to go into A and D and the 1176 I was sending, right? That worked fine for years. Then my friend David Kahn showed me a way that he would mix vocals. And this was right around the time I think that Nirvana hit, because I remember I had a serious downtime where I wasn't, I wasn't really that busy. That happens. The way he would do it is he would compile a vocal by using different sounding compressors, which is a completely new concept to me. 
And so what he would do is he would find a compressor that had maybe a lot of throat to it and another compressor that had like sweetness, another one that kind of head tone, another one that might have intensity to it, you know, and he would just start build these, the vocal by different sections of the head and the chest. Some one compressor might sound, you know, very chesty. Another one might sound very rich and dull, but but with a brighter compressor, maybe with an 1176, it would just match. And out of that, you would have this really big sounding compressor out of all of these compressors. The way the sound would come out is that you'd have a vocal big and present, but it wasn't knocking the meter down. I was like, how do you get that? And you could hear the full, full tone of his voice or her voice, and and as he would push it, the vocal would blossom. Oh, I was just, this is incredible. Now, his approach was to, to compile this vocal sound, and then he would assign all of those, that blend, so with one fader, they would all go up and down. So. His vocal sound was all about the return. So it's already, in essence, it's pre-compression, right? He gets that sound, he goes to the return of the compressors, and he assigns them all to one fader, and then they all go up and down, and that's the sound. I had committed to mixing into compression because I found that to be exciting. What I did was, I would build, I would be sending the vocal to these four or five compressors. I would get my sound and then I would leave those alone. And then I would ride the main vocal that was floated. It wasn't going to a stereo. It was only returning to these five or six compressors. And I discovered that I had maybe, you know, an inch, inch and a half of space where I could just ride the vocal and as I was riding it into the compressors, it would blossom. The vocal would get just more exciting, not more compressed. I mean, it, well, it depended because it was a small window where it would be too much or not enough. But, you know, by, by experimenting a lot, they got to be a point where I had the vocals at returns at a good level, and then I could push into it. And I found that that it was almost in reverse mixing, but I could just, when somebody wanted to get loud, I could just, you know, I could back off, but it would still be big. And then for quiet, I could just dig into the compressors and send it. Sometimes I would go this far up the fader into these compressors and you would just hear the voice blossom. The best example of that is parachutes. The way that vocal sounds so vulnerable and open and it just takes you in as a listener right from the beginning and that was all going on with this send return approach and back then i had on the desk i had a fairchild 666 i had my federal i had an 1176 i had a gates compressor that was four. Maybe back then I only had four. Was there another one? Oh, and maybe, maybe an LA two is sometimes. But that's how I got my tone. So then when I went hybrid, when I went hybrid, I was still trying to use some of the analog. Everything was analog except the 1176 blue stripe. Ah, right. Again, I had bought four or five. I, didn't, I couldn't buy a, sec, a second 666. I still have that one. I managed, you know, I managed to, to substitute with something else, but they were still mostly analog. Then, when we really moved into the template of all in the box, we had to try to emulate these. And what was the function? The function was, well, you need to find a compressor that has throatiness to it, another one that kind of has a chest feel to it, 
another one that has kind of a head tone, and then give me one that gives me intensity if I want it. Oh, I know what was another one. It was, I think I had a distressor coming up too. Yep, we still the, have that. The, the distressor was part of that, that group. That was the function. It wasn't trying to emulate the compressors. It was trying to emulate what is all this. Then you put that little picture together, then you got yourself a vocal. Which, by the way, I am designing with a particular plug-in company so that you will, at some point, get this whole vocal chain kind of in one plug-in. Hopefully, it'll be exciting. Or, or you'll probably see this video one day and go, Where, whatever happened to that plug-in? Where is it? For now, Fernando, why don't you show everyone what you did to get that across? Just a quick rundown on the signal flow so everybody understands how this is routed. The vocal audio track will come into the folder, just like every other channel, but then the output of the folder is not going to any bus. It's going to this utility track that we call Lead Vocal Dry Sense. And if you see the output of Lead Vocal Dry Sense, it's no output. So like Michael was saying, you won't hear the vocal coming out anywhere but through the returns of the compressors and obviously any effects like delays and reverbs. On the sense of the lead vocal dry sense track, we have the sense to all of our different compressors and also the vocal delays that we showed you earlier. So with this fader, the lead vocal dry sense fader, Michael can control how much he's sending into all of the compressors and obviously these compressors are all calibrated so that when he sends to all of them, none is compressing way more than the others. Everything is receiving the same amount of compression and output. Which is one dB. Mm -hmm. So I make sure that every compressor will see one dB of compression, and then the return will all match at zero. So no matter which one I listen to, they're all coming back at the same level and they're all compressing the same amount. So therefore, when I'm sending that vocal through, I know that everybody's getting the same kind. The exception, of course, would be the 1176 with all the buttons in, and that is just what it is. And then in on the distressor, I usually have it in Nuke. And again, these are two compressors that I use when I'm trying to deliver more intensity to a vocal that is lacking intensity, or it needs to yell a little bit more. And so these are specific compressors to a specific job. One of the things that, that is important to note is that that send is post my main fader, right? So just, Explain that real quick. I am not riding this fader. I am riding that fader. So this whole concept is emulated from the SSL console. So the folder is acting as the large fader in the console and the lead vocal dry sense is acting as the little fader, which is post. When Michael is actually writing the vocal, he's writing the large fader, which is the folder, and the lead vocal dry sense, which would be the small fader, is just static. So we start at minus 13, because that's calibrated and that's mostly where it stays, but depending on the song, he might want a little bit more, a little bit less, and he'll just put it where he likes it, and it will stay static. So now we go into the actual compressors. When I first started modeling this, because most of his compressors were very boutique or special or rare, I couldn't model one to one. So like he said, what I was trying to achieve was find something that was achieving the same characteristic. That being said, these compressors that we're seeing now, only the blue stripe, the distressor and the fur child are from my original template because the blue stripe was always a plugin since we, we were hybrid the distressor was modeling the distressor and the Fairchild was modeling the Fairchild. The other four compressors have been in-the-box additions just through experimenting with a lot of different compressor plugins and Michael picking which ones he likes, 
putting the settings how he likes. So this is a completely in the box thing, obviously doing the same result and function, but it's not a one-to-one -one match. So let us show you what we have going on. So the first plugin is the TLA 100. This one is really interesting because I know the guy who originally built this, this was Anthony DiMario. And when I first got this, you'll get compressors and you go, yeah, 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 you know, nothing special. And he brought this compressor by and you just don't want to look at the meter because if you, if you look at the meter and go, oh, like 3 dB, that should just be fine, you know. You know, you close your eyes and you listen to it, and when it would get down around seven, it suddenly would wake up and this whole other thing would be happening. Again, that shimmering kind of sound that it was so exciting to a vocal. It wasn't sounding compressed, it just sounded like a different character. It was very, very exciting. So that was so well done by SoftTube, and that became the main compressor of the chain. Like I would almost always start with that and then build around it. So the TLA was more of a kind of the, the feel of the, the face, right? Mm -hmm. Then let me find something that's got real graspy, throaty stuff, like things going on. And that became Pawn Shop. It looks cool, it sounds cool. And there's all types of little combinations going on in there. I don't remember any of it. I haven't touched it since I found the sound that I like. But that's got kind of like that nice throaty, guttural kind of thing going on, which, you know, you can use if, if need be, all right? I mean, every vocal is gonna be different, but Pawn Shop, that was all about something going on down in here. And was there anything else on that? Oh, I think I had... Across all of this, just so you know, we have a Pro Q3, just so we don't get that extra s in or, or a little harshness. But on this particular compressor, we also have uh, a little pull tech. And that's what I would do when I had all my compressors returning on the desk. I had the SSL across all of them because they were loading up on the 300 generally. And so if you go to the SSL, you'll notice that they probably, there's attenuation, right? Yep. And there you go. So for the most part, I would take some 300 out because when you get all these compressors together, you needed that clarity and it's in a bell function, right? And then depending on the compressor, as you can see, I attenuate a little bit of 3800 or something. Why? Because, you know, <laughs> because. And we'll leave it at that. So we take that out. Now we go into the Presto. Now, the Presto is a very, very special compressor. It was actually Powers who turned me on to that compressor. It was a Jersey, I think it was a, it was a Jersey radio compressor in the 60s. He had it modified. And so when I heard it, I was like, wow, there's just this, sweetness to it. It's a, uh, yeah, it, it, it's just kind of lush sounding compressor. It's beautiful. It's a tube. It was a tube compressor, as, as was the TLA. He has a choice. You can do the, the P41 or the LA1B. And I think that was copying the early, early Teletronics, maybe, I, I, I don't recall, but the P41 is all I cared about. And it's good, it's in the ballpark. I mean, he's, you know, he's absolutely fanatical about making sure that these plugins are proper. And so that made me really happy because when he told me that he had one, of course, I was the first one, I, was, I gotta hear this. <laughs> and then what do we have on that for the Q? Is there anything that is, again, there's just a little bit of that going on. And then probably this one didn't need it. I didn't, I took a little 60 out, otherwise it felt fine. And again, remember, I always had these returning on the SSL. So I'm just continuing that path. I just, I, 
I am an SSL through and through. And just because I'm not on a console doesn't mean that I want to continue hearing SSL in my head. So then we go into the blue stripe. Function of the blue stripe is really about that British setting, that real intensity. Because sometimes a vocal is, just sounds a little bit lame. You know, the performance could have been better. And this is a miracle setting where it just, it, <laughs> it excites an unexcited vocal. I believe all the ratios are in, mm -hmm. correct? Yep, correct. And so that thing just goes crazy. And that's its whole function. It's really more of a urgency factor. And here, I don't seem to need anything because it doesn't really have much low end, mid range anyway. Then we go to the compressor, the distressor. Now, what's interesting about this particular mode is that I had to change it a little bit, but what I used to do, I would have it in six to one or maybe 10 to one with his toggle switch. I mean, what I was hearing is that I wasn't hearing the distortion from the plugin, from the, the uh, toggle switch is what it was creating. And when I asked, when I told David about that, he goes, well, wait a minute, let me look at the circuit. And actually it bypassed the actual distortion part, but it was still giving the excitement. And I believe that was when I would have a 10 to one opto, it changed, the opto circuit was different than all the other numbers. And so when I would put it in 10 to one and a little British setting toggle, which eventually I think that's gonna come out, I'll, I'm going to switch everything and we'll go right into that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll have to look at it all again. It became beautiful, beautiful character. Um, but for this one, it's six to one with, you know, fairly fast release, very quick attack and a lot of input. And, you know, the, the, these attack and releases are references. I, I wouldn't say to you that the attack really is what controls the input threshold. So I wouldn't put everything on, well, that's gotta be a fast attack because if you put it at seven, there's no compression going on at all. So it's really more as like playing between the input and the attack. That's more like at the nasal area, right? That's just kind of the front of the face. And the EQ, it doesn't look like I needed to take anything out. And then the Poltec, I took a little top end off, but the fact that it just goes through that particular Poltec is just this warmth. I mean, that is such a beautiful modeling. I use it all the time because I don't even have to put the EQ in. You put the Poltec across an instrument and you just get this extra little, I don't know if it's a combination of warmth and presence. It's a, it was beautifully done. Then we get to the Fairchild, which is more of a head tone, you know, up in here area, head, chest kind of thing. Again, a really good job on the Fairchild. It's just this silky sound. And again, it's interesting. I, I don't have that many attenuation going on on here. I don't know why, but I don't hear the vocals as feeling muddy. so. That's probably why, you know, as I'm mixing, I'm constantly tweaking for, for, for the first year. I was constantly tweaking everything because I'm trying to recreate what I was doing on the desk, the sound of the desk, the sound of that particular compressor. You know it, you know, I was just like constantly, whoa, what is this? What am I, what do I have to do? And so this is what I, where I've ended up. And then the last one is the vocal box inflator. This one, again, just had a, a different sound than the others. It had a, a clarity to it. I use it sometimes and sometimes I don't. It's got a few things in it. So it's almost like a, you know, it's like a channel strip. It has a certain upper mid range clarity that I like. And again, I don't use all of these. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. 
I have one starting point and I bring the vocal into it and then I'll just go, mm, then I'll go over there and then I'll just fidgeting. Now, these are the returns, but here's something that's important that we have to discuss that probably should have been discussed before we get to this is the tone. I am doing some pre-compression. So let's go back to the vocal because I need to tame it a little bit, right? Because if this vocal is really, really dynamic, I don't want it to adversely affect some of these compressors so that some of them are, are acting you know, a little crazy. I want to tone it down just a little bit. In general, I'm going to create the character of the vocal on the insert. In other words, if it's a vocal that needs to be warmed up and fattened up, I will use the LA-2A. And so that tone then sends to the other compressors, right? And so all the other compressors are reacting to this tone. And I'm just taming it. I rarely have it going to half a dB or a dB, unless of course it needs it and it needs to be smashed. But in general, that's not the case. And if I, you know, if that's too warm, then maybe I'll put it through a 33609. Maybe because I want it to be silkier and richer and lusher, lusher. And then as it goes, and you can tell how well it works by how it sends to the other compressors. And you can hear that tone right away. Or maybe I'll put it into something even clearer. Maybe what have I done in the past? Troop Tech CL1B, uh, Magic Death Eye, the LA2. LA-2A Silver. Right, and LA-2A Silver has a, a much different character. And so these are all subtle, some are subtle, not so, others not so subtle. I temper it and I create the character at the top. And that's the only point where I'm doing pre-compression so that no matter what I'm doing with a fader, it has tamed it just a little bit as it sends to the other four or five compressors. And that is the chain. Now, what also is interesting, and, and again, I had no idea actually that I was doing this, but because the main vocal is floated, I still sent all my reverbs off of it, and I sent my 1176 what I do with the 1176, this adds, this adds the presence. So if there's a lot going on and I just bring this in, suddenly you have more presence without getting anything really louder. It's just, it's like almost like a presence meter. But it's also going to all the reverbs. When people would listen to the vocal, they go, how? How is it that the, the reverb on the vocal just seems to be so suspended and so clear? And then what I realized is that those reverbs and everything are sending off the original vocal before any of the process is going on. So when the compressors are working and, and forming and stuff, they're doing that separately from what the reverb is seeing. And so that's what was creating this beautiful depth that in reality is because the vocal is floated. So that is the whole vocal chain.